this book. Thankful for the promise that there's a place where there's no sorrow there, no burdens to bear, no sickness, no more pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day. What a glorious day that will be. I just about preached on Revelation chapter 21 this morning. Where John saw the new heaven and the new earth coming down as a bride adorned out of heaven. A city prepared by and for God. I'm telling you what, if you're a believer in Christ today, you've got something to look forward to. We've got something on the other side that's far greater than all the problems of this life, all the chaos of this world. God's still on the throne. He's still in charge. He's still at large. He's not worried. He's not concerned. He's not downtrodden. He's not depressed. But he's as powerful and he's as full of his might and his glory as he's ever been. He's not worried about an election. He's not worried about a coup. He's not worried about a terrorist attack. He's got it all under his hand and under his finger. And he says to us, in the, Paul writes to us in the book of 2 Corinthians, he says these momentary and light afflictions, momentary and light afflictions. He's, he's minimizing the problems of your life. You say, is he saying that my problems are, are not as big as they seem to me? That's exactly what he's saying. He's saying when compared to the eternal glory that is waiting for you on the other side, the problems that you go through in this life are just tiny they're just minute they seem great now but oh they're so small one day all the things that have caused you to shed tears in this life all this all the depression that you face has caused you to shed tears all the anxiety that's caused you to shed tears all the problems in this life that have caused you to shed tears the Bible says that God is going to take his hand and he's going to wipe those very tears away from your face Heaven's not a place of crying. Heaven's a place of joy and happiness. As Marla would say, if there be any crying in heaven, there'll be happy tears. Amen? There'll be happy tears. That's not what the Lord led me to preach this morning. He led me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and in verse 5, I want to I wanna read just for a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 5. It's a, probably a familiar passage to you if you've studied the Bible for any period of time, but it's one I've never preached on, but I think it's important to the believer. The psalmist said, I lift my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And the, the question that we have to ask as believers is, from where does our help come? Uh, from where does our help come? Or as the psalmist said, the King James, from whence cometh my help? From where does my help come? When you study the book of 1 Corinthians, you'll find some people that had some mis, uh, misconstrued ideas about where the power came from, about where the help came from. Uh, they thought it was in the personalities of men. They thought, they said, if we have a good preacher, if we have a good singer, if we have a good choir director, if we have good Sunday school teachers, I'm making a modern day application. But they said, if we have all these great personalities, then we'll have what we need to experience the power of God. But what Paul is teaching them here is this. It's not in the personalities of men so much as it is in the power of the maker. I will say that again just so you don't miss it. It's not so much in the personalities of men, but it's in the power of the maker. I've seen preachers who couldn't write their name preach a sermon that would call fire down from heaven. And I've seen preachers who have Ph.D. at the end of their name preach sermons that couldn't get blood out of a turnip. I've seen men with great charismatic attitudes and they'll get up and they'll rant and they'll roar and they'll scream and they'll holler and they'll throw, they'll pitch babies from the balcony and they'll pull tissues out of the Kleenex box and the Spirit of God will not move. Likewise, I've seen men never raise their voice above a whisper. 
They tell us that the great revivalist Jonathan Edwards preached a sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And they said by the end of that sermon, you could hear people weeping and wailing in the audience outside of the building. And they said as he would read his manuscript, he would never get his voice above a whisper. You see, the Word of God needs no additive. The Word of God doesn't need my charisma to make it powerful. The Word of God doesn't need my education to empower it with the power that comes from on high. All the Word of God needs is a cause and a means. Now you say, what's the cause, preacher? The cause is the Lord Jesus Christ through the power of His Holy Spirit. The means... For some reason, God allowed you and I to get in on his plan, and he said, you're going to be the means. Remember what he told them in Matthew chapter 28? He said, go you therefore in all the world, teaching them to observe whatsoever I have commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We call it the Great Commission. God is, is ordaining his people as the means by which his message will be carried. But you can have the means, and if you don't have the cause, you don't have anything. Amen? Amen. You ever seen people without a cause? You know why the, I really believe, and and I'm I'm no historian, but you know why I believe the colonists defeated the Britons in the American Revolutionary War? I really believe this with all my heart. And I've, I've read, I'm sure people have read more than I have and know more about it than I have, but I really believe this with all of my heart. I believe the colonists defeated the Britons in the American Revolutionary War because the Britons had a half hearted interest in being in the colonies in the first place, and the colonists had an undying desire to be free from the rule of Great Britain. You ever seen people without a cause? They look lost, they look like they're wandering aimlessly. When we talk about people without a cause, I really believe this today with all of my heart. It's a lot of churches. A lot of churches don't have a cause. A lot of believers in churches don't have a cause. They live, could we say it this way, causeless. They live without purpose. They live without meaning. They live without uh, understanding what the meaning of their life is. Now, here's the thing. If you are... Maybe a CEO of a Fortune 500 company, you may have to to search out your cause. You may have to try to figure out and clearly define what your cause is. But listen, dear friend, for the believer, the cause has never been stated more blatantly and more clearly. You don't have to ask God what the purpose of your life is and then spend the rest of your life wondering what it is. He has told you what the purpose of your life is. So many people live in this world wondering aimlessly, not knowing what the meaning of their life is. I've read so many stories about people who are famous, people who have money. Jim Carrey is one of the greatest examples of people who have money. They amass great wealth. They get great fame. They get great fortune. And yet, when they reach the top, the very pinnacle of the American dream, they find themselves empty and wanting. Yet you can go back and read books like Fox's Book of Martyrs. You can read books like The Martyrdom of Polycarp. And you can find people who had nothing in this world. Not a thing to their name. No possessions to speak of. No great wealth and fame to be noted. No great purpose among the men, uh, among scholars, among people of great prodigiousness. They had no, no great notoriety to their name but yet they had Jesus Christ and in him they found the greatest joy that could ever be found you know the happiest people I find in my life is when you go to a church and you preach and you find some little old lady that sits on the back row or just right there in the back and 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 you can tell she's a prayer warrior you just look at her and say I guarantee that woman prays and I don't know, she's no county commissioner, no city commissioner, no, no pastor, no, maybe not even a Sunday school teacher, doesn't have any great notoriety, but I don't know, she looks happy to me. Don't, don't she, you, you know those people I'm talking about, she looks like she has joy. That's exactly what Paul is telling the believers at Corinth here. He, he's saying, dear friends, if, if you want to experience the power, you've got to understand where the power comes from. You can water dirt, but if you don't plant a seed, nothing's going to grow. Amen, Brother Do. Is that right? You can water, and you can water, and you can water the dirt, and you can have sunlight fall on that dirt, but if there's nothing there, if there's no seed, then it will not bear fruit. Paul said, listen, 
He told him in verse 4, he said, one says I'm of Paul, one says I'm of Apollos. He said it doesn't matter. He said it doesn't matter who you're of. God gives the increase. There was division in their church. You say, preacher, why was there division? Because they had focused on the personalities of men. Great preachers don't make great churches. Great music ministries don't make great churches. Great Sunday school teachers don't great make churches, make great churches. You know what makes a great church? A collection of people who understand that they are totally and wholly dependent on God for anything and everything that they want to accomplish in their work. Amen? That's what makes a great church. It's not defined by their people, but it's defined by their attitude towards God. So they needed to be aware of cultivating the praise of men. They needed to be careful of making it too much about men and understanding that it was only God who could give them what they needed. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5 says this, Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believe, they're just means to an end. As the Lord gave to each one. Paul said in verse 6, I planted, you know this verse, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything. Now, now listen to that. So then neither he who plants is anything. Anything good you do for the Lord Jesus Christ, you ought to take no credit for it. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one. And each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field and you are God's building. Father, help us to preach this morning with Holy Spirit anointing. Help us to preach with clarity. Lord, as we try to expound on your word and what it says to us today, Lord. Lord, we want to acknowledge that anything good that we do comes from you. God, anything good that we accomplish is accomplished through your power. We need your power, Lord. Help us to understand it today. Set our words on fire. Do through this time what only you can do. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. I titled this message this with this thought, Spiritual Miracle Grow. What is it that makes the life of a believer grow? What is it that makes a body of believers grow? Because let's be honest, that's who Paul is talking to here. He's talking to a body of believers, a group of people, a, a, bu- a, a bunch of members which make up a church. Now, now you understand this, don't you? When you get a whole bunch of people together, it takes a real skill to make them all work. We got a lot of different personalities in a church. You got people that talk a lot. You got people that don't talk a lot. You got people who are charismatic. You got people who are quiet. You got people who are argumentative, and you got people who are peacemakers, right? Amen? No, no argumentative people in here? Huh? They're all gone. Amen. All right. Well, praise God. It makes my job a lot easier. And so you got all kind of different people that make up a body of believers, all kind of different personalities. Let me tell you one thing, number one, that makes, a, 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 that makes growth possible. Uh, you want to you want to pour some spiritual miracle grow around the work of God, then you've got to appreciate one thing. Number one, I want you to notice it in this passage of scripture, and that is diversity. You must appreciate diversity. Uh, Paulus and Paul are two people who are mentioned here, two men who serve the Lord but served in very different capacities. Now let me ask you what Peter asked the Lord. Who of them is greatest, right? Because that's what everybody wants to know. We love this word great. It's a popular word that we use today, especially in the political scene. And so we want to know about this word greatness. And, And one might ask, God, when you measure out the work of Apollos and you measure out the work of Paul, who was the greatest? Paul had more souls. Obviously, he went on more mission trips. Paul gained much more notoriety. He had much more fame. 
If you ask people which of these Bible characters do you recognize first and you said Paul or Apollos, I would guarantee you that at least 95 to 98 percent, if not all people, would say I recognize the name Paul. The Apostle Paul has been the source of many historical documentaries on the History Channel. They've examined many of his letters through documentaries. He has gained, even outside of the Christian faith, great notoriety. But if you were to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ today and you were to say, Jesus, tell me whose work was greater, Apollos or Paul, he would say neither of them is greater, but they are both equal in the kingdom work of God. And the reason for that is, is that everybody doesn't play the same part. Everybody doesn't preach. Everybody doesn't teach. Everybody doesn't lead music. Everybody doesn't do the same thing. But we appreciate our diversity and we're unified around the fact that though everybody does something different, everybody is equally valued in the kingdom of God. Paul told him at the church at Ephesus in chapter 4, verse 11. He said, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So we all do something different. We all play a different role. We all serve in a different ministry and we do a different task. But we all understand that no labor is more important than another. No member of the body of Christ is more important than another. But I found this in my time in pastoring, that unless every single member of the body of Christ pulls in the same direction with the same intensity, you cannot accomplish what God wants you to accomplish in the kingdom work of God. You can't do it. Every single person has to be pulling in the same direction. People say, how do you grow a church? I say it's this way. When every member is pulling in the same direction with the same intensity. Now, now that's hard because, see, we're all, we're, we're, we're all people who are up and down. Wouldn't you say amen to that? Boy, we're up and down. Amen? amen? I mean, sometimes I'm discouraged and maybe David's encouraged. Sometimes Jennifer's encouraged and maybe David's discouraged. Sometimes Mark's encouraged and maybe Lynn's discouraged. And sometimes my dad's encouraged and maybe Brandon's discouraged. Maybe sometimes Brother Bill's discouraged and Jerry's encouraged. So it's hard. It's hard sometimes. But, but I, I believe God designs it that way for a purpose. Well, if everybody in here was discouraged at the same time, it'd be bad, wouldn't it? Now, if everybody was encouraged at the same time, it might get good. But if everybody in here was discouraged, we might not have nobody here on some Sunday mornings. Amen? And, and so God designs it that way so that when you're on the mountain, you can help the one in the valley. And when you're in the valley, somebody up on the mountain can help you out. I can't tell you how many times I've been discouraged and somebody's provided a word of encouragement for me that has helped me to keep going. We're in the ministry of edification. One thing we have to do as members of the body of Christ, we we got to appreciate diversity. Everybody doesn't do the same thing. Everybody serves in different capacities. Everybody does different ministries. But he, here's, the, here's the amazing thing. As a pastor of this church, I can say this and know this to be true. Stand behind the pulpit and preach Sunday morning, Sunday night, teach on Wednesday night, try to lead the church. God does not value my work any more than anybody else in this church. I'm of no greater importance to God my work is of no greater importance to him than anybody else. We're all serving, and we're all trying to accomplish the same thing. Paul said one labor plows, one sows the seed, one waters the seed, one continues to nurture that seed. See, there's a long process of growth there. But always remember it's God who gives the increase. Number one, we appreciate our diversity. There's a second thing. That you got to have. And that is unity. Number one, you must have diversity. But number two, you must have unity. Look at what Paul says to us there. He says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. That's the growth formula. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now look at verse 8. Now he who plants and he who waters are one. Are one. Barry Snap 
uh, put something on Facebook last night. He said, uh, togetherness is important. He said, if you only have two teeth, they look better when they're together. I thought that was funny. You ever seen somebody with two teeth? They'll be spaced out on both sides of their mouth. You all know what I'm talking about now. You're visualizing it. And so unity is always better. Togetherness is always better. I think sometimes people think it's like a Ponzi scheme, a preacher trying to get people to church. Uh, almost like a businessman trying to sell Kirby vacuum cleaners. Listen, I don't stand anything to gain by more people being here. I, I, I mean, if, if you think it's about money, I make the same thing every week, whether you come or not. Amen? Now, if you stop giving, we may have problems. And then I might come see you. But anyway, but, 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 but here's, here's why the man of God encourages a believer. Number one, because the Word of God says so. And, and, and really, at the end of the day, that's enough. But it is because also that there's great benefit to being a member of a body of believers. When there's unity. Now, now listen, when there's disunity, a body of believers can cause great harm. How many of you ever met somebody or ever tried to invite somebody to church and they told you of a past experience where they'd been hurt by church people? Anybody ever had that experience? Of course we have. We all know somebody who is bitter towards church. They're bitter toward the things of the church because of a bad experience that they had in the past. So, so boy, when you parade around under the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you parade around in an attitude of disunity. You better be careful. I just got to tell you that right now. You better be real careful because you're messing with risky business. You're playing with fire. But when the work of God and the body of Christ is unified, nothing can be more powerful. Did you know this? Christianity has always played against the odds. Christians have always been outnumbered. They've oftentimes in different areas of the world always been gunned for by whether it be governments or whether it be by different religious groups who were radical. Christians have always played against the odds. And yet through a unified spirit, and through the power of the Holy Ghost, they have always been able to not only survive, but thrive. Now you tell me why that is. I really believe this with all of my heart, that it is because of the unity. When you begin to study the early church, you begin to look back in the book of Acts, the Bible says that they had some important things. First, the Bible says in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 that they were instructed by Jesus Christ to stay in Jerusalem and to wait for the promise of the Father. What's the point there, preacher? The point there is that a church cannot thrive and survive without the Spirit of God. You cannot thrive without the Spirit of God. You've got to have it. You keep on reading and you'll find that he tells them, he says, uh, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? For this same Jesus which is taken up from you shall so come in like manner, even as you've seen him go. We all know that passage of Scripture. And the point of the angel saying that was this. Get out there, boys. Start working. Start plowing for the kingdom of God. Start doing the work. So you say, preacher, what does a church need? A church needs the Spirit of God. But a church also needs an anticipation for the coming of God. I really believe this with all of my heart. One of the worst problems in the church today is that we've grown so numb to people talking about the return of the Lord that one day he's literally going to come like a thief in the night. And Jesus said he would be like a thief in the night to the world, but unfortunately it's going to be like a thief in the night to the church because we're not ready. You say, preacher, what does an anticipatorial attitude do? What does it do when we start anticipating the coming of the Lord? It'll make you get up and get busy. Break your heart to read through the book of Revelation and find out what people who are left behind are going to have to endure. And break your heart to read Jesus' talk. People, people, people want to desensitize the Bible. Listen, friend, the only thing Jesus talked about more than money was hell. Two things he talked about. Two most prominent topics that he talked about was hell and money. And that's the two, uh, side note, that's the two things people want to hear preached on the least. Amen? Might be the reason he talked about it so much, because we need to hear more about it. Amen? Maybe I'll preach on tithing next Sunday and hell the week after that. Amen? We'll just cover it all. But we try to desensitize it. We need to understand that there is a God, and he is returning, 
and, 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 and those who don't know him are really going to experience the separation that this book talks about. When a church has an anticipating attitude, begins to get serious about the work of God. But then thirdly, you'll notice this. After, after the angel said, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up to heaven? The same Jesus which is taken. I've already quoted that. You know that verse. You know what the Bible says? They went back and gathered in one place and they prayed. And then the Bible says they were what? They were in one accord they were in one accord they were unified they were of the same mind they had the same mission they had the same purpose oh man let me tell you something when we talk about the work of God there's nothing more important than unity there is disunity Everywhere you look in this world. You want to see disunity? Just watch the Republican National Convention this week and you'll see disunity. Turn it on C-SPAN and watch a session of the House of Representatives and you'll see disunity. Turn it on C-SPAN too and watch a session of the United States Senate and you'll see disunity. Turn it on ESPN and watch people fighting over sports and you'll see disunity. Turn it on The View and you'll see four liberals and one conservative fighting over things and calling each other names and you'll see an example of disunity. God help us if the church looks like the world. God help us if the church looks like The View. God help us if the church looks like Fox News or CNN or all of these different places. But let the church be a place where people can come as a refuge to find unity and to find encouragement and to find the help that they need from the Lord. That's what the church ought to be. We ought to be unified. Listen, there, there's nothing, nothing in this church that could happen so important over, over, over uh, bringing disunity in. Nothing. Save that a pastor preaches against the Word of God or preaches outside of the Word of God. Everything, and, and, and listen, you, you probably agree with this too. Most of the things we argue about in church are just flat petty, aren't they? Now I've got to say this, in two and a half years... I don't, I mean, we, we, we haven't had a lot of petty arguments. Not in deacons meetings, not in leadership meetings. I, matter of fact, I can't think of a one. And I thank God for that because I hear other preachers talk about things that they have to deal with. People want to fight over everything, want to fight over uh, moving furniture. They want to fight over decorating the inside of the church. They want to fight over all these different things. And, and what we need today more than ever is unity. Thirdly, this morning, and I'll be done. Number one, we need diversity. Number one, we need unity. Number three, we need humility. We need humility. Paul used the example of the field as a church, the harvest. I asked uh, Mike this morning, I said, what you been doing? You been harvesting? He said, oh, no, it ain't near time for that. I said, what do you do between planting and harvesting? I said, I thought you just planted, watered, and waited. And then you harvested. And he was telling me about prep, prepping the machines that are used for harvesting. And uh, there's a lot more to it than you would think. But Paul used the image of a field to explain to these believers what he was trying to get across to them. And he said, dear believers, number one, the emphasis must be on God. And not on the laborers. <clears throat> and you know that's a funny thing because if you think about gardening, at some point you depend on God. Because you can have water and you can have sunlight, but at some point you're at the whims of nature. If there's a drought, you're in trouble. If there's too much sunlight, you're in trouble. If there's not enough sunlight, you're in trouble. And so at some point even the farmer is trusting in God. But then you look at the importance of that in the, in the life of a spiritual believer. <clears throat> the emphasis always must be on God. Paul and Apollos were just servants. They were just servants who did 
what God told them to do. There was nothing special about them. They were just obedient people. It's, it's, it's scary to think about what untapped potential we leave in our lives only because we can't figure out a way to be obedient to the call of God on our lives. We're much like Moses in Exodus chapter 3, but Lord, I can't because of this. But Lord, I can't because of that. But Lord, I can't because of this. But Lord, I can't because of that. And God says honestly and without being too crude, He says just shut up and do what I tell you. He said, who do I tell them sent me? I am. And that's the very same banner that you and I go out under when we do work for the Lord. The very same one that Moses went out under. I am that I am. They were just people who were obedient. Nothing special about them. Nothing set aside, nothing different about them. They were just obedient people. But Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, that even their faith was a gift from God. They were just servants. Look not to the servants, but look instead to the Lord of the harvest. Look not to the people, but look to the one who has the power. It's not human labor that produces a harvest, but it's the increase that is given from God. You say, preacher, what do you mean by the fact that we need humility? We need to understand that it's not in us. It's not in us to work up. It's not in us to manufacture. It's not in us to make up. But it is only something that comes from God. And you can search everywhere in the world to try to find it. You can try to work it up however you want to. But until you acknowledge that there's nothing in you that can make it happen, but it only comes from the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll never receive it. Jesus said this in John chapter 4. He was preaching to them on that very subject, the harvest. Jesus said to them, he said, My, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another weeps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labors. One man comes along and sows. Maybe you come behind and reap the harvest. One man comes along and sows. Another comes behind and reaps the harvest. Maybe you sow the seed, and somebody comes behind and reaps the harvest. I remember very well, just several years ago, Brother Bill and I walked into a man's house. We shared the gospel with him, and within 45 seconds, he was weeping and ready to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. When we got out to the car, I said to Brother Bill, I said, I think somebody's been and talking to him already because he was ripe for harvest. I guarantee you somebody had come by and sowed seed. Somebody had come by and watered. And then we just came by at the right time and we reaped what had already been sowed. Our job is not to ask God to give us the results that we want to see. Our job is not to ask God to give us the produce or the yield that we want. But our job is to wake up every day, put your hand to the plow, and keep pushing forward. Keep pushing forward in spite of discouragement. Keep pushing forward in Side of, in spite of depression, keep on going and let God give the increase where he sees fit. It doesn't matter what we expect. It doesn't matter what results we think ought to be. God's not asked us to be in the, in the business of producing the yield. He's just asked us to be in the business of being the sowers. Keep sowing. Keep sowing. Keep sowing. You say, preacher, we knock on doors and nobody gets saved. Does it matter? What is it we seek? Results? We can go back and tell people the results. We're not in the business of producing results. We're just in the business of sowing. Keep sowing. Keep knocking. Keep, keep sharing. You say, preacher, I've shared with my coworkers, and none of the ones I've shared with have responded yet. That's not our business. 
It's not our business. Our, our business, we're not in the results business. We're just in the sowing business. You say, preacher, I got family members that I've been sharing with, that I've been sharing with, and I feel like they're as hard-hearted as they've ever been. It doesn't matter. We're not in the results business. It, uh, to be honest with you, it takes a lot of the pressure off of you and me. God's not asked us to produce results. He's just asked us to sow seed. Just asked us to sow seed. That's all he's asked us to do. We don't need self-power. We don't need self-ability. We need humility to say this. God gives the increase. God gives the increase in, in every aspect of our life. In your, in your spiritual life, in your quiet time, you want to see personal spiritual growth, sow seeds within your own life, and God will water them, he'll make them grow. God will give the increase. You want to see spiritual growth in your family? Sow, sow, keep on sowing. What's the law of the harvest? Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he reap. You can't not sow any seed and then wonder why you don't have any reaping. You can't wonder why there's no yield at harvest time when you haven't sowed any seed. You want family growth? Sow seeds. You want growth in your ministry? Keep sowing. You want growth in your church? Keep sowing. You want growth in your lost friends? Keep sowing. Keep sowing seed. And God will give the increase. You say, preacher, how do you know? Because Paul tells us right there in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and I'll be done. He who plants, he who waters are one. Listen to the next part. And each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. God wants to see increase. <clears throat> Have you ever thought about when you... It's amazing how growth works. You ever thought about when, when you grow something in a garden, you grow a vegetable or you grow a fruit, what's inside of that? Seeds. Seeds which produce more. More fruit. It's amazing how, how growth works because, see, we could never understand... In all that Paul saw in his life, I imagine on this side of eternity, he never could have seen or understood all of the growth that came from his ministry. See, because Paul went down to Ephesus and he preached and a man was saved. Maybe Paul never saw that man again. But that man began to go out and to share and to plant other seeds. And those seeds, some of them fell on rocky ground, some of them fell on good ground, but... But those ones that fell on good ground, they grew up and they produced more seed and they went out. You see, that's how growth works. That's how the early church turned from 12 plus Jesus to thousands in just a few short months. Just kept on sowing, kept on sowing, kept on sowing. You know, when you go to sow grass in a field, you, you, you don't go sparingly on the seed. You just you keep sowing. You sow as much as you can. You turn that spreader and you just keep on sowing. You just keep on sowing because you want to make sure if some of it dies, there's enough there that will still sprout up and give you what you're looking for. That's the idea of a believer. Just keep sowing. Is there something you want in your life? Is there something personally, spiritually you want in your life? Sow the seed. Is there something you want in your children's life? Sow the seed. Don't wait for the preacher, the Sunday school teacher to do it. You take the initiative as a parent and sow that seed. Is there something you want in your ministry? Is there something that you want to do in the calling that God's placed on your life? Sow the seed. You want to be more committed to the work of God than you've ever been before? Don't just talk about it. Don't just pray about it. Don't make short-term commitments, but start sowing the seed. And watch as God gives the increase. Well, we thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that our job is not to, our job's not to water, our job, our job is not to give the increase, our job is just to sow the seed, to take care of it, to water it, nurture it, but ultimately you give the increase. God makes our job a lot easier we're not in the business of results. We're just in the business of sowing. God, help us to be sowers. Help us to not be